Good afternoon, friends. It's good to see those of you here in the chapel, and it's good to gather near and far, those who are watching in your homes. We are glad that we can gather in worship, and those who will be watching this on YouTube later, welcome. Today is our last worship in the month of January, and so that means we want to make sure we give a big thank you to Deanne Diller, who's been playing piano for us in this month. Thank you so much, Deanne, for your lovely playing and sharing your gifts with us, and we will see you again later in the year when she can come back. Today we also have a guest speaker that some of you might remember. Wendy Miller is here, and Wendy has um, been a chaplain here at Showalter Villa from 2010 to 2019, and we are so excited that she can be here with us. We're sorry that there aren't more people that are able to be in the chapel today because of health concerns, but we are so glad that you can see her at least on the screen, and maybe at another date we can see her more in person but you might remember that wendy was also a pastor she was a pastor for 12 years she is married to mark and they have three children two of them are adults living on their own now and then their youngest son devin is a senior here at heston high school so since um, 2019, Wendy has been at home taking care of household things and, her, and paying attention to her health. And um, we look forward to hearing more of an update about how you're doing. So thank you for coming and sharing your story with us today. Well, let's um, join in a, well, actually I probably should, should announce something about Bible study. Is Bible, Bible study will just be on channel two Friday, is that correct? for health care, okay, and then for, um, we're not sure yet <laughs> what's going to happen with assisted living, but check, check the bulletin boards or check with Cherie about that, but um, yes, so let's join in a call to worship. This is actually a prayer, so I just invite you to pray with me. No matter how far we wander from you, O oh God, your steadfast love finds us. No matter how unjust the world seems to us, O oh God, your steadfast righteousness sustains us. No matter how vulnerable our lives seem to us, O oh God, your steadfast presence gives us hope. No matter how unloved and uncared for we may feel, God, you hear our cries and answer our prayers. We are so grateful and we desire to worship you with joy and thanksgiving. May our worship glorify you today. In the name of Jesus we pray. Amen. I invite you to turn to your hymnals to Great is Thy Faithfulness, number 327.
Wendy has requested that I read these two scriptures that are on the back of your order of worship. So if you'd like to turn to the back, you may follow along as I read. The first one is 1 Peter 1, 3 through 9, and then 21 to 25. Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. By his great mercy, he has given us a new birth into a living hope through the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead and into an inheritance that is imperishable, undefiled, and unfading, kept in heaven for you who are being protected by the power of God through faith for a salvation ready to be revealed in the last time. In this you rejoice, even if now, for a little while, you have had to suffer various trials, so that the genuineness of your faith, being more precious than gold, that though perishable, is tested by fire, may be found to result in praise and glory and honor when Jesus Christ is revealed. Although you have not seen him, you love him. And even though you do not see him now, you believe in him and rejoice with an indescribable and glorious joy. For you are receiving the outcome of your faith, the salvation of your souls. Through him you have come to trust in Christ, who raised him from the dead and gave him glory, so that your faith and hope are set on God. Now that you have purified your souls by your abundance to the truth, so that you have genuine mutual love, love one another deeply from the heart. You have been born anew, not of perishable, but of imperishable seed, through the living and enduring word of God. For all flesh is like grass, and all its glory like the flower of grass. The grass withers, the flower falls, but the word of the Lord endures forever. That word is the good news that was announced to you. And then John 16, 33. I have said this to you so that in me you may have peace. In the world, you face persecution, but take courage, I have conquered the world. Wendy, we invite you up. May God bless you and strengthen you to share his word. Thank you, Jill and Anita. It's really good to be here. It brings back lots of memories as I was thinking about coming in here, I was thinking about the days when we had quarantine, like today, and I know it's hard to not be able to be here. These are tough days. Um, I also remember lots of special times we shared um, in this place and worship services in this chapel. I remember the old chapel, remember that, Cherie? And uh, the process of renovating, we had worship services in the Harvest Dining Room, we had funerals in the front lobby. Um, we adjusted, right, as you are now. And um, I remember as we were building this chapel and envisioning uh, these beautiful stained glass windows and the day that we were able to bring everybody in here and unveil them and um, all the meaning that's behind them. And so I want you to know that this continues to be a special place for me. I have been in prayer for you over these difficult years. And I want to thank you for your prayers for me and for my family. I'm glad to report that I'm doing well and that my family's doing really well as well. Uh, I left here very ill. Um, but um, I'm glad to be here. And I just want to thank you, Jill and Anita, and commend you. And um, say that you here at Show Alter Villa are blessed by their ministry and their leadership. And I'm grateful for that. So life does throw us unexpected curves and hardships and knocks, does it not? 
Some of you might remember the movie, um, also it's a musical, Annie. And uh, this rambunctious, red-headed Annie led her fellow orphans as they sang and danced, uh, scrubbing floors and washing dishes, and marched their way through chores and bounced from bed to bed and through pillows until the feathers flew as they defied and de proclaimed victory over their hard knock life. And uh, if you remember the words of that song, it's a hard knock life for us. Instead of treated, we get tricked. Instead of kisses, we get kicked. It's the hard knock life. Don't it feel like the wind is always howling? Don't it seem like there's never any light? Once a day, don't you want to throw the towel in? It's easier than putting up a fight. Can you relate with that? Yeah. It's a hard knock life for us. The song ends. And Annie did have a hard knock life as a mistreated orphan with a drunken caregiver who often found herself in trouble. But she dreamed of the day in which she would be adopted. And she continued to hang on to hope. And in the meantime, she sang and danced and inspired others. It seems that the success of this movie is because all of us experience times when it's a hard knock life. And we're inspired by her spit and her grit and her spirit in the midst of it. There are many realities in our own lives and in our world which would make us concerned and realize the reality of the hard knocks of life. And so it was for Jesus. As he faced the hard knock life that was before him, he was able to say, in the world you will have trouble, but take heart. I have overcome the world. Jesus makes this and other wonderful promises in John 16 as he is facing his own death and suffering and as he is preparing his disciples for what lies ahead. He doesn't want them to lose heart. He wants them to remember what he has said, and he promises that the Holy Spirit will come to help them. He promises that the evil power of Satan will be overcome, that better days are coming, and that their grief will turn into joy. And he uses a wonderful illustration of a woman who has the pains and agony of childbirth, forgetting all that as she experiences the joy of the child being born. And he says, take heart, it will be worth the pain. And I think it's important for us to remember that when Jesus said these things, he had not been resurrected yet. He was facing the worst weeks of his life. And in the midst of that, he was able to say, you're gonna abandon me, you're gonna scatter, I'm gonna be alone but I won't be alone because my Father is with me. What confidence and trust and peace, my Father is with me. And Jesus also found courage in focusing on the end result, that he would be victorious over sin, over grave, over the evil one. And so he is able to say, your grief will turn to joy. Take heart, be of good cheer. I appreciate the writing of Rick Lance as he talks about this. The New Testament Greek word, often translated in our scriptures as be of good cheer, can also be translated be courageous. The word courage comes from the Latin um, derivative Cur, which means heart. So, to take, to take heart is to be courageous. To lose heart is to be discouraged. To help other people take heart is to encourage. I think I'm going to say that again. To take heart is to have courage. To lose heart is to be discouraged. And to help others take heart is to encourage. I trust that today as I share that I can be an encouragement to you wherever you are and whatever your life experience is today. 
as you and others have been an encouragement to me. To live in the way that Jesus lived, the way that faithful followers of Jesus lives, is to live in hope. And that's where our first Peter passage comes in today, in which Peter set, uses the phrase, living hope. At times, we can think of hope as being that thing that keeps us going for the great thing that we anticipate in the future. And yes, it is. But today, I would like to focus us and challenge us that hope is something that lives now and affects our lives now. I love the phrase that Peter uses here in verse 3, living hope, that God has given us a new birth into a living hope through Christ's resurrection and into an inheritance that is imperishable, undefiled, and unfading, kept in heaven for you. Sounds pretty great, doesn't it? What on earth does not perish or fade or rot? Who are being protected by the power of God. I love that phrase too. We are being protected by the power of God through faith for salvation ready to be revealed. And so in this you rejoice, he says, even for a while you face various trials that the genuineness of your faith being more precious than gold that though perishable is tested by fire may be found to result in praise and glory and honor when Christ is revealed. So as they are living in this time of tribulation and Peter is writing to them, their faith is being tested. And it is proving to be genuine and becoming more precious than even gold. In other words, God is doing something within them in this process and it is very precious. And he goes on to say that although you don't see him, you love him, and even though you don't see him now, you believe in him, and you rejoice, get this, with this phrase, with an indescribable and glorious joy, for you are receiving the outcome of your faith, the salvation of your souls. He's not saying you will receive. It is you are receiving. It is something that we can experience now. Through their belief in Christ, they have this indescribable and glorious joy because they are already receiving their salvation, which I believe is the presence of God alive in them. The fact that our hope is living helps us to live now and empowers us for today. And the presence of God with them and with us in this transforming process also changes how they live, even in the midst of their difficulty. And so the next section of this uh, chapter, 1 Peter 1, goes on to make a call for holy living. Therefore, prepare your minds for action and discipline yourselves. And this call to be holy and obedient children like Christ is a call then to love one another. It isn't, he, so he goes on to talk about how they should live now in loving one another in their life experience. So it's not just about the future, although that will be wonderful, right? Have you ever heard the phrase that some people can be so heavenly minded that they are of no earthly good? Being heavenly minded is a wonderful thing, but being of no earthly good is not. And I think Paul, Peter is giving us the keys here. And in verse 21 it says, Your faith and hope are set on God. God is the center. God is the focus. And that's what we see Jesus living out as he goes towards the cross. That the presence of, of God, his Father, with him in the midst of his suffering was that shining star that kept him going. And it goes on to say that your souls have been purified in obedience to this truth. You're living this truth. And so you are born anew through this seed, the living and enduring word of God. People die 
grass dies, flowers die, but the word of God lives forever, this passage says. And that word is the good news that was announced to you. You are staking your life on this news, this living word of God. So if we look at what carried Jesus through his suffering, it was the presence of his Father and his belief in the enduring word of God, the truth of what was coming, gave him the living hope for the suffering and the death as he anticipated resurrection. And what struck me as I was looking at this this week is that in the midst of suffering, he loved others, which is what this passage calls them to, mutual love for one another, live a holy life in obedience as Christ did. And we see this evidence as Jesus is hanging on the cross in this terrible agony, and he looks down and says to John, this is your mother, and to his mother, this is John, take care of her. And when the thief on the cross taunts and one asks for forgiveness, he says, Today you will be with me in paradise. And ultimately, he says, Father, forgive them, for they do not know what they do. In the midst of suffering, he was thinking of the others. This hope, this awareness of the Father's presence guided his responses in his suffering. And so it makes me ask the question, what about me? What about you? What about us? Are we just surviving? Suffering through each day for the day when the mortal will be swallowed up by life? Or does the living hope, the awareness of God's presence with us change the way we approach each day? First Corinthians talks about the Holy Spirit as a deposit guaranteeing what is to come. The Holy Spirit is alive in us. How do we experience that? How is this living hope realized in your life? What carries you through? I think those are good questions for all of us to live with and to find our way through, especially in the midst of hardship. For me, the living and enduring word of God, both written and the presence of Jesus, the living word of God, carried me through some very dark times. When I left here three and a half years ago, I was really ill. I didn't know how ill I was, in fact. And we weren't sure what was going on. I had this awful rash that covered my body and it was swollen and it was miserable. And it took about two years to really settle that down from the time I left here. And um, now I'm a year and a half beyond that. And praise God, the medications and the treatments worked. And I actually just went off of the medication that was suppressing my immune system and keeping the rash away. And it's away. Yes. And I can live without agony all the time. Thank you, God. But I shared part of that journey in my last sermon here on September 4th of 2019, and I thought I was getting better. And I was in certain ways, but I actually got worse. And there uh, was much encouragement that you shared with me and prayers, and I want to thank you for that. And in the final service here in the chapel, uh, Chaplain Jill and Gary, at the time, um, led some blessing for me. And one of those um, included giving me this, this bowl. And a number of people um, came and would um, read a scripture stone and put it in the bowl here for me with scriptures of promise to carry me through in the hard days. Things like, remember, I am with you always. Cast thy burden upon the Lord, and he shall sustain thee. Let not your hearts be troubled. I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. This is how the living word continues to carry us 
in hard times. And at night and in the day times, um, I would cling to those. And Gary and Jill had a blessing for me. They, they anointed my hands. And in Gary's prayer, he proclaimed that the best ministry was yet to come for me. Now, that's pretty amazing. Because I wasn't doing well. What a prayer of faith and confidence. Because the very next day, I had some scans. One of them was suspicious. And I had to have a recheck and biopsy. And in the midst of this, our son Micah became very ill, and we didn't know if he would ever live a normal life again. And he and I were both in suffering together. Life had gotten out of control. And I remember the day that I was waiting for the biopsy results, and it was going on and on, and the house was quiet and I went and sat in the recliner and I found myself praying, God, I don't want it to be cancer, but just show us what we need to know. And within minutes, the phone rang and it was Susan Crable's nurse saying, Susan wants you to come in to discuss the results of the biopsy. And I knew that meant bad news. And I called Mark and we went in and Susan shared it is cancer. And she cried with us because she knew everything that we were going through. And she also prayed for us. And as we proceeded with the treatment plan, I kept going back to that. God, show us what we needed to know. And just sought to trust that God had shown us through the careful, relentless work of our doctors to find out what was going on. Getting rid of the cancer did not get rid of the rash, which we had hoped for, but it confirmed that it had been found very early and that I avoided chemo, which was good because my body couldn't have handled that. I went to Mayo Clinic twice, trying to figure out what was wrong. Mike and I were both on a very long road to recovery, and it was a very scary time. But God showed up over and over again, like through these scripture verses. I can't even begin to explain it all, how God showed up and encouraged us. And we truly found life in the hope that we had for healing and in the presence of God with us. And people saw angels over our house as they prayed for us. And we both came to understand in a very powerful way that God had work for both of us to do. And that we were going to overcome through the power of God. You know, these struggles are not just physical. They are mental, they are emotional, they are spiritual. And in the miserable nights and the uncertain days, I hung on to these scriptures and to songs that were given to me, and I meditated on them. And I love the word in Psalms for meditate. It's like a cow chewing on a cud, right? You chew and you chew and you chew to get all the nourishment and to get sustaining from it. And one of those songs was a song that Bethany Schrag sung in the last service that I had here that September. It was entitled, May This Journey, or um, Jesus Draw Me Ever Nearer. It was not a song that she knew or I knew, but God just led her to it. And so I would invite you to listen to that now. Bethany couldn't be here to sing it, but we're going to play it. And just listen to the words and think about um, what they say to us.
What amazing prayer of release and trust. At the end of my heart's testing in your likeness, let me wake. The experiences of this life, when we trust God in the midst of them, can bear the fruit of growing into Christ's likeness. They can refine us like precious gold, imperishable, that create treasures that have eternal value. These sufferings change us. And they can be used if we choose not to get bitter. To help and encourage and transform others on their journeys. I leave you with this song and this encouragement, not in any way to diminish the pain of whatever it is you might be facing right now. I know that many of you are suffering and that some days you would rather it just be over. I walked these halls for nine years. I saw suffering beyond imagination, suffering that changed me. I get it. I get it. And sometimes it is truly surviving each minute through the pain, which is a victory. My prayer is that the power of Jesus may enable you to experience God with you and to transform your sufferings for, for God's glory and that even in the midst of struggle you may find the joy indescribable that First Peter talks about. This song that we just heard in the midst of uncertainty and misery reminded me that God could do something with my pain. That the journey wouldn't be in vain no matter how it ended. Gave me comfort and courage. And it helped me to trust the process. May you hear Jesus speaking in the midst of whatever your life holds today. We can remember not only Jesus' words, but his calm confidence in his Father through life, death, and victorious resurrection. Yet I am not alone, for my Father is with me. I have told you these things so that in me you may have peace. In this world you will have trouble, but take heart. I have overcome the world. Thanks be to God. Thank you, Wendy, for your powerful testimony, for encouraging us to take heart, for um, sharing the blessing that you have received out of the suffering. We are blessed today. Thank you so much. Let's turn in our hymnals to hymn number 340, Tis So Sweet to Trust in Jesus. Um, Wendy has selected this hymn and the next one as well. These are important to her and also to us. 340.
or you're witnessing to the work of God in your life and in the life of your family, Wendy. Before we go to prayer, I want to just share that Delbert Mueller, an independent living resident, and then for a short time, a resident in healthcare, died this past Sunday in Wesley Medical Center. His memorial service will be tomorrow in Stafford, Kansas at four o'clock in the Minnis Chapel. Let us pray together. We praise you, O oh God, for the great mercy you have shown to us through Jesus Christ. We praise you for the living hope that you birth in us through Jesus, a living hope that sustains us in every kind of time and in all our days until that time when we will meet you face to face. We praise you, our God. Now today we lift up to you the family of Del Mueller and we ask that you sustain them with an assurance of your gracious mercy. Comfort them as they remember Del with gratitude. I also lift up to you our community of Showalter Villa. I pray for our residents in health care and assisted living and in independent living and I ask that you come near to each one. Be especially near to those who are ill, to those who are suffering. I lift up to you all staff members and our leaders and administrators, and I ask for each of them compassion and wisdom and strength. And I also thank you today, O oh God, for the ministry that Wendy Miller has had here in this community, and I ask that you continue to bless her as she continues to serve you. Thank you for your protective and healing and refining work in her life and in the life of her family and the way that their lives touch many. Finally, O oh God, we lift up to you this beloved and broken world of yours. Please show each of us ways in which we can bar be part of your healing movement in this world. We are grateful for your vision of a time when the implements of war will be transformed into implements of sustaining harvests. Please nourish a living hope in us as we live today and in you and as we look forward to your future. In gratitude, we receive the good news that you announced to us, that your word endures forever and that truly your son has conquered the world through self-giving love. We take heart because of this, this truth, and we encourage one another in it. Jesus, draw us nearer. We pray in your name. Amen. Please turn in your hymnals to number 343, My Hope is Built on Nothing Less. And let's sing verses 1, 2, and 4.
And as you go today, may you know the presence of Christ with you. Receive this benediction from Romans 15. May the God of hope fill you with all joy and peace in believing, so that you may overflow with hope by the power of the Holy Spirit. Amen.